All right, welcome back. Uh, we are now going to move into module number three. Uh, and in module number three, we're going to talk about the Open Shortest Path First Protocol, or OSPF. Uh, we're going to talk about four different things. Well, actually, lots and lots of different things when it comes to OSPF. But we, we have essentially four different lessons that we'll be covering in this module. We're going to talk about basic OSPF, kind of go, go back and, and fill in some of the the gaps and whatnot on the theory of OSPF, much like we did with the IGRP, talk about the, the concept of the protocol itself and take a look at some of the basic elements of OSPF. Uh, and then we'll get into uh, talking about the adjacencies within OSPF. Uh, we'll talk about how to build the routing table. Um, and that also includes taking a look at and investigating the details of OSPF adjacencies uh, and then exchanging of link state information through the use of different types of link state advertisements. Uh, and then in module or lesson number three in this module, we'll take a look at summarization. And then we're also going to take a look at special area types in OSPF. Uh, that's an important concept, very important concept, talking about stub areas and totally stubby areas and not so stubby areas and totally not so stubby areas. Uh, and then finally, we'll wrap up uh, our discussion about OSPF by taking a look at uh, OSPF v3 for IPv6 and IPv4. So quite a bit of information that we're going to talk about in this uh, in this module. It's about the same size as the EIGRP module, uh, just a fewer lessons in this particular case. So we know that OSPF as a protocol is a pretty widely used routing protocol. Um, we know it's that it's a link state protocol and so on. So Let's, uh, let's start off by getting into lesson number one. And in lesson number one, we're going to talk about how do we establish neighbor adjacencies between OSPF peers. Uh, lots and lots of things that we'll talk about in this lesson. We'll talk about uh, why I would choose OSPF over other routing protocols. Uh, there are some very obvious reasons, but there are some not so obvious reasons why I might decide to do that. We'll talk about basic operational steps with link state routing protocols. Uh, we'll talk about the different area types, uh, different router types in OSPF. What are some of the design limitations that we need to concern ourselves with? Uh, the different OSPF message types. And then how do I establish OSPF neighbor relationships over point-to-point -point links? Uh, how do we establish OSPF neighbor relationships over an MPLS VPN? Uh, not only layer 3 MPLS VPN, but a layer 2 MPLS VPN. And then we'll take a look at the different neighbor states, the down, the init, the two-way, the xstart, the exchange, the loading, the full. Uh, and then we'll talk about different network types. We, I kind of alluded to a few of those network types already as we were talking about EIGRP, uh, the five different network types. Uh, and then we'll finally wrap up this lesson by talking about uh, passive interfaces. And then you guys will be doing a challenge lab. But throughout this process, we'll also be doing several different discoveries as well. All right. OSPF as a protocol is a link state routing protocol. Uh, it uses Dijkstra's algorithm, D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A-S, uh, which is called the shortest path first algorithm uh, to implement uh, routing selection that, or to, to implement the routing selection process. Uh, OSPF as a routing protocol is very hierarchical in nature, unlike EIGRP. EIGRP is really a flat type of routing protocol, uh, meaning that everything goes essentially into one autonomous system. As a link state routing protocol, we know that uh, from our discussion about the differences between link state and distance vector, that this protocol has kind of a much more robust uh, understanding of the topology. Uh, but because of that, it also requires more resources. Uh, the databases can get a little bit more complex. But we're going to go through the process of not only building these OSPF databases, but we're going to go through the process of analyzing that database and, and the sub-elements of the database to really understand truly how to troubleshoot and verify OSPF operation. Uh, OSPF was first developed uh, in the early 90s under RFC 1131. Uh, that was the version, first version of the protocol. Uh, and uh, the uh, 
current version of that we're presently using today, specifically for IPv4, is OSPF version 2. That was spar, uh, specified in RFC 1247 and 22, um, excuse me, 2328. And then we have the implementation of OSPF version 3, which is used specifically for IPv6 networks. Don't confuse the idea or the, the definition of OSPF v3 uh, because there's a couple of different distinctions for OSPF v3. Number one, uh, OSPF v3 does mean OSPF for IPv6, but it also references this concept of, of uh, a similar concept to what we saw with named configurations in, in the IGRP. OSPF scales to an extremely large size. In fact, it's essentially infinite, uh, you know, in, in terms of the size of the internet and whatnot. OSPF can scale to an extremely large size. It's an extremely fast routing protocol. It can converge very, very quickly. Uh, it's relatively simple to configure, but just like with the IGRP, configuring the protocol is not, only, not the only thing that we're generally concerned about. We're also concerned about understanding the theory, how the protocol operates, how it runs, um, you know, what kind of decisions the protocol is making as, as we're building the network. And, and based on that understanding and that knowledge, we can make better decisions on how, how OSPF is going to actually operate, uh, not only uh, fundamentally, but also efficiently. Uh, OSPF runs directly on top of IP. It uses protocol 89, uh, so there are no transport layer components like TCP or UDP. Uh, just like any traditional link state routing protocol, OSPF discovers the neighbors. It exchanges uh, full information with those neighbors, and then beyond that, it does incremental updates or, or uh, uh, you know, bounded updates with those neighbors based on topology changes in the network. Now, it does do a uh, periodic update. Uh, every 30 minutes, OSPF floods its uh, routing information out throughout the autonomous system, and that's called a paranoid update. So there is, there is a periodic element to uh, sending out routing updates and advertising routes, uh, but it's primarily considered to be an incremental routing protocol. The metric for OSPF is actually quite simple. Uh, it's based solely on one element, bandwidth. And we'll, of course, get into calculating metrics and, and taking a look at paths and whatnot as we go through the process of understanding the protocol a little bit more. OSPF uses two different multicast addresses uh, to, to disseminate information, 224.0.0.5, which is the multicast address that's reserved for all OSPF routers, and then 224.0.0.6, which is uh, the OSPF multicast address that's reserved specifically for talking to what we call designated routers or backup designated routers. We don't understand necessarily what those routers do within the concept of OSPF, but we'll certainly get there and we'll talk about all of those concepts a little bit later on. If for some reason the underlying network that OSPF is running on top of does not support broadcasting capabilities, which means inherently it doesn't support multicast capabilities, we can establish neighbor relationships statically using unicast neighbor relationship commands and we can statically assign our neighbors. OSPF does not do automatic network summarization, uh, was never designed to do that, unlike EIGRP and IGRP. But uh, summarization is a possibility with OSPF. We just have to do it manually. And there's actually only two different types of routers in OSPF that you can summarize on. If you guys recall from our discussion in EIGRP, we could summarize in EIGRP on any router within the autonomous system, and we would simply apply the summary to an interface. In OSPF, we're restricted as to which routers we can actually summarize on. We can only summarize on area border routers or autonomous system boundary routers. We don't know what those are yet. We're gonna get into that in a little bit, all right? OSPF does also support authentication. It does clear text authentication, uh, uh, MD5 authentication, and 
secure hashing algorithm authentication or SHA authentication. Uh, again, we'll we'll get into that that part of that discussion, not in this module, but the authentication piece will be our final module of the course. So let's get into uh, a little bit about how OSPF fundamentally operates, and then we'll kind of start to do a deep dive in each one of these elements. When we talked about routing protocols in general, we talked about three different things, right? We talked about the message types that are used to exchange and communicate information about the protocol. We talked about the algorithm that's being used by the protocol. In the case of EIGRP, that was dual. In the case of OSPF, that's Dijkstra's algorithm. You can see that there on the blue arrow. And then we also talked about the data structures. So just like EIGRP, OSPF has three primary data structures. It's got the adjacency database, it's got the link state database, and then finally we have a routing table. All right, so we're going to take a look at all of that uh, in, uh, you know, just a whole lot of detail. Uh, and I think that you guys, by the time we're done today with these four different lessons, you'll feel extremely comfortable with OSPF and you won't have any issues, uh, you know, getting into it yourself uh, in quite a bit. Uh, of detail in your own enterprise. All right, so what we're looking at in this diagram here is we've got uh, you know, four routers that are exchanging OSPF information. Uh, adjacencies in OSPF are physical. You know, in other words, the routers have to be in a common broadcast domain in order for them to be able to form adjacencies. Uh, when I say physical, I don't mean they have to be physically connected by a wire. Uh, there could be switches in between, there could be layer two uh, service provider networks in between and so on. But uh, we will not ever form an adjacency with routers that are in different broadcast domains throughout the, throughout the enterprise. So R, R2 is essentially going to be a neighbor with R1 and R4 in this case. R1 would be a neighbor with R2 and R3. R4 would be a neighbor with R, R2 and R3 and so on. All right. So we establish those adjacencies. We use hello packets to do that, just like we saw with, with EIGRP. Uh, and um, the next step then is for everybody to go ahead and exchange routing information. Uh, and um, once we do that, we put all that information into a database. In EIGRP, we saw that as our topology database. In OSPF, it's called the LSDB, or what we call the link state database. All right, and uh, it's not quite as simple to analyze as, say, an EIGRP topology database. Uh, it is actually quite more, uh, quite a bit more complex, but that's because OSPF is a little bit more complex in its operation. But we're certainly going to go through and talk about what happens with that database. So. Uh, that is the second data structure that we construct in, within OSPF, that link state database, and that contains every, everything that we need to know, everything that uh, I've learned, a best route, next best route, uh, all of the link information throughout the entire topology, uh, and it's stored in, in different formats, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, we go ahead and run our algorithm against that database, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, and we'll learn how that algorithm works. That allows us to build our, our shortest path first tree, and then uh, based on that, uh, we then extract our best routes. And that's ultimately what the goal is, right, is to figure out, uh, you know, what the, what the best path is to reach particular destinations. The routing table itself is not specific to OSPF, the routing tables used by every everybody, but uh, in the case of OSPF, obviously our best routes are going to go into this routing table. Another aspect of OSPF is that it it is designed based on a hierarchical structure. Uh, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to have a multi-area OSPF design. You can actually implement OSPF very similarly uh, from an architectural standpoint to EIGRP in one big flat. Uh, area and then one big flat autonomous system. It just depends on the number of routers that you have, uh, the number of uh, routes that you're trying to, to um, uh, share, 
uh, you know, different aspects of design. And we'll talk about at what point it becomes kind of important to incorporate some of these other design elements that you may or may not include originally. Uh, this hierarchy is a two-stage hierarchy. We have our backbone area, uh, which is really designed to be a transit area to interconnect all of our other non-backbone areas. Uh, area zero is always defined as this backbone area. It has to be contiguous, meaning that the area cannot be you can't have multiple area zeros uh, separated by other areas in the in the domain. Um, and you can only have a single area zero. There is a slight exception to that rule when we talk about virtual links and how virtual links are configured. But um, with regard to basic design and, and uh, sound design, uh, the, the design element means that we're going to have to have a single area zero and it's going to have to be a contiguous area, uh, meaning that it's, it's not going to be broken up into multiple pieces. Every other area that's not the backbone area is something called a non-backbone area. So in this diagram here, we see that area one uh, and area two, these are non-backbone areas. All right. There's a couple of rules that we have to follow in this design, though. Uh, and it's very, very important to understand what these rules are. Number one, I've already given you one, area zero is our transit area. We usually don't have clients or hosts or, or devices in this area other than the routers. Uh, not to say that area zero cannot be used as a, uh, a service area for clients and, and network devices, but usually we try to reserve the function of this area zero as a backbone. All right, that has to be contiguous. Uh, in addition, any of the non-backbone areas have to be directly connected to the backbone. All right, so area one has to be attached to the backbone. Area two has to be attached to the backbone. You couldn't have, say, an area four hanging off of area two down here and then an area five and an area six. All of my non-backbone areas need to be directly attached to the backbone area. All right. Uh, in addition, these non-backbone areas have to be contiguous as well. You can't have multiple area ones, uh, and you can't have, uh, you know, individual areas that are divided up into separate pieces. Okay. There is an exception to the rule with regard to areas being directly attached to the backbone. I don't want to suggest that there's not a possibility of having a design that means that an area is not directly attached to the backbone. But uh, that is only allowed temporarily. Uh, I mean, it, as, as far as a, a design goes, it should only be done temporarily. Um, and uh, that's number one. And number two, uh, it, there's a limitation even in that design, right? Uh, unfortunately, the, the course doesn't really talk about that element. Uh, but I'll try to mention it and, and briefly show you guys what that looks like a little bit later on. But I could have, say, area zero here. I can have area two attached to area zero. But uh, if I did have another area, say area five, attached to router six, uh, that's as far as I can go. I couldn't have three or four or five or six different areas daisy chained together. The, the, the furthest degree of separation that you can have from one area to the backbone is another single area. And then that area, in this particular case, area two would become the transit area to create something called a virtual link between the area that's down below area two and the backbone area, all right? Um, I will give you guys a better explanation of that a little bit later on, all right? We also have, uh, you know, common terms that we see within OSPF. For example, you see a designation of ABR and you see a designation of ASBR. Uh, let's start first by defining what router one is. In this particular topology, router one is what we call a backbone router. By definition, a backbone router is any router that has all of its interfaces inserted into the backbone area. In the case of OSPF, we do not implement, like we do with the IGRP, we do not implement the protocols uh, on the router 
we implement the protocols on the interface, just like we do with the EGRP, uh, which means that we assign interfaces to areas. We don't assign routers to areas. The only protocol where you actually assign routers to areas would be ISIS, uh, where you're actually defining whether the router is going to be a backbone router or a non-backbone router and so on. So router one in this particular case is defined as a backbone router because has, it has all of its interfaces in area zero. Conversely, router five and router six, these are considered to be internal routers because they have all of their interfaces connected into a single area and it's not the backbone. So R5 is an internal router to area one, R6 is an internal router to area two. Uh, the ABR stands for area border router. That's gonna be any router that has its interfaces, uh, well, at least one interface attached to area zero and the remaining interfaces attached to other areas. So that's why it's called an area border router because it is a router that borders multiple areas into the backbone. Now the ABR does not necessarily have to be a member of only two areas, uh, but it does absolutely have to be a member of the backbone. All right. So I could have another link right here that goes down to say um, uh, routers. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I could have a, another link here from the ABR that goes to router six, which would then extend area two up to this ABR router as well. Um, so there's a couple of different uh, ways that you can connect these ABRs, but I don't want it. I, I don't want it to appear that an ABR really can only be uh, a member of two areas. It can actually be a member of multiple areas as long as it's always a member of the backbone area. All right. Uh, and then we have something called an ASBR. This stands for Autonomous System Boundary Router. Uh, this is a, a router that has at least one interface in OSPF, and it actually doesn't have to even be in the backbone. It could be in area two or area one or whatever. Uh, but then it also has another routing process running on it externally, either EIGRP, BGP, maybe some static routes, maybe some connected routes that aren't part of OSPF. Uh, natively uh, and what's happening on this ASBR is we're performing something called route redistribution where I'm taking routes from one area uh, for, excuse me from an external routing process and I'm injecting those routes into OSPF through the process of redistribution all right the optimal number of routers per area is going to depend on a couple of different things there really isn't a hard, fast number that we use to define that uh, because it's going to determine, it's going to be based on the density of the network, how many redundant links I have, how many redundant connections I have. But Cisco does recommend that you have no more than 50 routers in a single area. Uh, that's a general uh, design element that we try to, try to maintain. Uh, again, that number may end up having to be less. It just depends on how many, uh, what, what the density of your network is, how many redundant connections you have, how many networks you actually have, uh, because just because you might have only 10 or 15 routers in an area doesn't mean you ha don't have 30 or 40 or 50 paths that you have to manage within that area. All right. I mentioned a few of the restrictions that we see with OSPF. Uh, OSPF does have special restrictions when you're dealing with multi-area design. Uh, if you have more than one area, uh, at least one of those areas has to be a backbone, all right? It has to be area zero. Uh, so it's, it's kind of uh, a good practice to start with the core and kind of design out from that, from that space. So uh, area zero becomes essentially the core of your network and then area one, area two, area three, these are going to be either branch locations, maybe a headquarters location, uh, or these are the, the sites that you're basically interconnecting. Remember that backbone has to be at the center of all the other areas. You cannot have area one directly connected to area two. It's not possible. Uh, first of all, one of the elements that need to be met when we're, when we're trying to form an, a neighbor adjacency is that uh, routers have to be in a common area 
on the on the same interface within the same broadcast domain. So if I took a link from area one router here and connected it over to the area two router here, that would break that rule, right? Because one interface would be in one area and the other interface would be in a different area. All right. The backbone does have to be contiguous. You're not allowed to split it into multiple parts. So just like in EIGRP, we had five different message types in EIGRP. We had a hello packet, an update, a query, a reply, and an acknowledgement. Well, we have five packet types in OSPF as well. Packet type number one is a hello packet. That's uh, the packet that we use to establish and build our neighbor adjacencies and maintain those neighbor adjacencies. We have something called the database descriptor packet uh, used for database synchronization between the routers. Uh, I'm gonna get into some more detail on what that database descriptor packet is a little bit right now. Uh, actually, a little bit later on. Um, we'll talk about the whole adjacency process and the steps that we go through to form these adjacencies and what, what happens when we are communicating information back and forth between the routers. We have uh, type number three, which is a link state request. This is where we're trying to request specific link state advertisements from another router. Uh, not like uh, a request in, well, I guess the analogy from an EIGRP perspective, a request would be, would be kind of considered a query, right? Because a query is me asking for something. Uh, and uh, subsequently, a request is me asking for something. But these are completely different concepts, right? We already saw that in EIGRP, a query occurs whenever I lose my successor route and I don't have a feasible successor and I need to verify whether or not an alternate path still has viability. Uh, in the case of OSPF as a link state routing protocol, those, those concepts don't really exist. We don't have to have all these different loop avoidance mechanisms built into OSPF because it has a complete picture of the topology. So in this case, a link state request is literally, hey, I understand that you know information about this route. I'm requesting that you give me all the information about that particular route. Uh, and it's done typically in, link state requests are typically used in the initial convergence process when I've established a new adjacency and I'm now going to try and uh, synchronize my database with that neighbor that I just established an adjacency with. Uh, type code number four, a link state update. Uh, just like uh, an update in EIGRP, it's just me sending out routing information. And then finally, we have our link state acknowledgement, which is a way for me to acknowledge the receipt of information. Three packet types in EIGRP were acknowledged, update, query, and reply. Three packet types in OSPF are acknowledged, the DBD, link state request, and link state update. So we're already starting to see a lot of similarities between uh, the different protocols here. Um, so that being said, we're gonna go ahead and get into our first discovery within OSPF. And this is gonna be a discovery where we're gonna learn how to configure OSPF, uh, how to establish neighbor adjacencies, what is the impact of, say, changing the MTU on an interface? Uh, what is the impact of uh, modifying hello timers, dead timers? Uh, and how does, that, how does that influence the neighbor relationship process? We're also going to learn about, in this particular uh, discovery, what is a DR, a designated router, and what is a backup designated router, and, and how do we control that election process, and why would I want to control that process? So we'll, we'll get started on this discovery uh, and uh, just kind of start building in, uh, building all of the, the, the elements and the components of understanding OSPF from a fundamental standpoint. All right, so we got our uh, discovery lab built, loaded up. Let's take a look at what we're gonna be doing in this particular discovery. Of course, I'm gonna add a bunch of stuff uh, to this as well, because I think it's important that you guys uh, get to see uh, some other things that, that you know, I kind of see on a regular basis as I'm configuring the protocols here, uh, specifically OSPF. So we've got uh, basically five routers in our topology here. Our one is going to be our ABR, 
uh, because it borders between area one, area two, and area zero. So that's our ABR. R4 and R5 are going to be our backbone routers. And uh, R2 and R3 are going to be internal routers inside of area one and inside of area two. So we're going to uh, do a couple of different things here. Number one, we're going to uh, configure OSPF on our, num our router number three. So we're going to set up OSPF on router number three, which actually is a really simple configuration, uh, very similar to what we saw in EIGRP. The only exception is that we're now going to be assigning uh, areas in the OSPF process. So Ethernet 00 is going to have to be assigned to area 2 in our, our loopback interface. 192.168.3.0 is going to be assigned to area 2. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at the DR-BDR election uh, between router 4, router 5, and router 1, which is going to include just a discussion about what is a DR-BDR election and why is it necessary, uh, what, what's involved in electing a DR, and, and you know, what's the purpose? You know, what's the function of that within an OSPF design? Uh, and, uh, and then for area one, uh, we're going to go ahead and configure OSPF on router number two. We're going to take a look at the different timers. Uh, we're going to examine things like MTU, uh, take a look at different adjacencies, and so on. So it's a lot of things that we're going to take a look at in this particular topology. Um, and uh, it's some good stuff. Definitely some good stuff. So let's start by doing just our basic OSPF configuration on router number two and router number three. Uh, this is what that configuration is going to look like. Uh, the, um, on router number two, we go into global configuration mode and we enable OSPF using something called a process ID. This is different than an autonomous system number. You'll notice that the numbers don't actually even match on the routers. On router three, we're using process ID three. On router number two, we're using process ID number two. Uh, this process ID, I usually make it the same. Uh, it just makes it simple. Uh, but the process ID is locally significant to the router and it simply identifies uh, it simply identifies the process of OSPF within the router itself. So you can actually run multiple OSPF processes on the router. Maybe you have uh, two different OSPF autonomous systems that you're participating in, so you'd have two different processes on the local router. Uh, it is an ID that you, you select. It's not uh, there aren't registered numbers versus unregistered numbers, and, and again, it's locally significant to the router. So on router number two, they've decided to use process ID number two, and on router number three, they've used, uh, decided to use process ID number three. Uh, and then we simply use network statements uh, to implement OSPF. Uh, network statements in OSPF require the use of an inverse mask. Uh, how specific or how general that inverse mask is just depends on what your overall objective is on on what you're actually going to be um, what you're actually going to be implementing. Uh, you know, do I want it to, to run on five interfaces or only a single interface and so on? So as far as network statements go, they do the same two things that we talked about when we started to talk about EIGRP. Actually, it was uh, yeah, EIGRP was the first time that we talked about the concept of a network statement. Uh, it tells the router which interface to run the protocol on, but it also instructs the routing process which networks are going to be included in the routing updates and the advertisements. The only difference here in this particular case is that we're also specifying the area that the interface is going to be a member of. Uh, so in this particular case, your network statements may actually have to be more specific because you might have to, you know, individually assign areas to different interfaces. All right. I'm going to actually do this uh, a couple of different ways because I wanted to show you the book doesn't really go into this, but I wanted to show you that there's actually another option when you're implementing OSPF for IPv4. But let's go ahead and start by going into router number uh, two and let's get our 
configuration done here. So uh, I'm going to do a quick show IP protocols as always, just to make sure I'm not running uh, any other routing protocol. I'll do a quick show IP route, uh, show IP route include connected, so I can see what uh, interfaces I have locally connected to my to my router. Uh, see, I'm already seeing something that I shouldn't see. Um, it looks like I'm missing a particular interface. So let me do a quick show IP interface brief. I'll bet you an interface is shut down. Um, ah my serial 2.0 interface is in an up-down state. So that's something that I'm going to have to troubleshoot and figure out why that's the case. Uh, if we look at our topology diagram, that is a frame relay connection uh, for this 12 subnet. So there's probably something going on with frame relay. Let me just check router 1 real quick and make sure that router 1 is functioning correctly. Uh, sometimes in GNS3 it does take a little bit of time for the frame relay connection to come up. So I'm seeing that it's up up on this side. It is possible that that changed on this side now. Uh, nope, still shows up down. So let me do a quick show run interface serial 2.0. Uh, oh, we're missing our frame relay configuration on the interface. Um, that would be why. So it's, uh, if I do a show interface serial 2.0, I can see that it's running presently HDLC. So let's go into the interface, interface serial 2.0, and just put in encapsulation frame relay. That should pretty much take care of it. There we go. It's changed to up. So now if I do a show IP route pipe include connected, I can see both the interfaces. This is kind of why... I do this. I just get into the habit of, of doing some basic checks before I just jump right in and start configuring the protocol because I would have gone through the process of configuring the protocol and then all of a sudden it doesn't work and now I'm like, well, I guess I didn't configure OSPF correctly. So I didn't really need to do that because I checked everything first. Am I running any other routing protocols? Are my interfaces up? Are they operational? And then I'm going to start to go in and do my configuration. So we're going to go config T router OSPF2 in this case. Uh, and we're going to specify a network uh, for the 172.16.12 subnet, which is uh, the frame relay link. Uh, and I'm basically just going to use the inverse mask of what's configured on the interface. And we're going to put that interface into area one. All right, uh, and we should see soon an adjacency form, uh, but let's go ahead and also implement OSPF on our loopback. So we're going to specify network uh, 192, 168.2.0, We'll put that in area one as well. All right. So we have now OSPF running on, on those two interfaces. Let's go ahead and do router number three as well. But I'm going to show you something a little bit different that you have available to, to you with OSPF, specific to enabling OSPF on the router. Uh, again, oh, geez. I will, let's go ahead and check this while I'm waiting for that to time out. All right, so the interface is definitely up, up. Show frame relay map. Let's see if our frame relay is active. Yep, our uh, frame relay is up and active. Uh, so we should see an adjacency form pretty soon. Show IP OSPF neighbor. We don't have one yet, but uh, actually we may not see it just yet. There's a couple things that I'm going to have to show you guys a little bit later on as to why it's not working. All right. Uh, so let me go ahead and go into router number three which I just closed, so let's pull that one back up. And in this case, I want to show you how we can configure OSPF without the use of network statements, even in IPv4. I'm still going to have to enable the OSPF routing process globally on the router, uh, but then I can now go into my interfaces, show IP route, 
include connected. I can now go into my interfaces and I can enable the OSPF process on the interface directly. That's one of the options that we have with OSPF for IPv4 that we didn't see with the IGRP. So instead of using network statements, I can go into the interface directly and enable OSPF on the interface. Uh, there is no better way, quote unquote, better way of doing it. Uh, whether you decide to use network statements or whether you decide to impl implement the protocol directly on the interface doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the result is still the same. OSPF is running on the interface. Uh, so let's go into interface loopback zero and do the same thing. So we'll put that interface into area two. All right. So we've got essentially OSPF configured on these two routers. Uh, and now we need to basically go through and identify if it's working, if it's not working, how do we troubleshoot it, how do we fix it, and so on. Uh, like I said, the network command is basically the same as it is in EIGRP. Uh, it allows us to identify by using wildcards uh, or inverse masks. It allows us to identify what interfaces are going to be participating in a particular area. The area can actually be written as a decimal number or it can be written as a dotted decimal number. Uh, let me show you what that looks like. Uh, so I can actually specify the area as a decimal value or I can put it in as, a, in a, as an IP address format, uh, which is the dotted decimal format. I, I tend to just use the, the decimal value. It's simple enough and it's easy to do. Okay. We already talked about how a router ID is selected within a routing protocol. And just as a refresh, in case you guys haven't seen the videos from the previous lessons, a router ID allows us to uniquely identify a router, uh, to uniquely identify a router uh, in the autonomous system. All right. Uh, that, that being said, that router ID needs to be globally unique within the autonomous system. All right, needs to be globally unique within the autonomous system, uh, meaning that you cannot have two different router IDs uh, or the same router ID on two different routers within the autonomous system. You'll get all kinds of crazy things happening in your network based on that. If you guys recall, the router ID is selected based on three individual checks. Number one, the router ID could be manually configured. Uh, and I'm going to show you guys how to do that in a second. Number two, the um, router ID could be selected based on the highest active IP address on a loopback interface. And then finally, number three, the router ID would be selected based on the highest active IP address on a physical interface. So actually, technically, we don't really need to assign the router ID to the devices in this case, because we already have active interfaces on each of our routers. In fact, if I come in here and I do a quick show IP protocols, I can see that the router ID was already selected as 192.168.3.1. And if I do a show IP interface brief, oops, brief, I can see that that happens to be the IP address on my loopback interface. So the router ID was already selected. Obviously, if our loopbacks are unique, then we don't have to worry about whether or not the router IDs are going to be unique because the loopback interfaces would be unique in this particular case. But oftentimes, yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, so if, uh, if I derived the uh, router ID from the loopback interface and then I added another loopback interface, say loopback one with a higher ID, would that require the adjacency to go down and up? I mean, would that happen right away? No. Uh, so the question was, if I go ahead and add another loopback interface uh, and it happens to have a higher IP address and I'm utilizing that method for selecting my router ID, would the router ID change? And the answer is no. Uh, in, in a lot of cases with OSPF, the, th the, the elements that are, being, uh, based, that are done based on election are non-preemptive meaning that once something has been selected, it stays that way uh, 
uh, until you manually change it or until the router reboots or something like that. Uh, so there is a way to force the router ID to become the new router ID, but uh, the idea is that that router ID remains stable and doesn't change because it, it will require resynchronization of the database because unlike EIGRP and OSPF, the router ID is used for everything. It's used for everything. Um, and that, uh, that can be a bit challenging uh, when you're trying to you know, enforce stability within your OSPF domain. So we can see that the router ID in this case was selected as 192.168.3.1 just to demonstrate. I'll go ahead and I'll create another loopback 200.200.200.200. Whoops, need a subnet mask. Mm -hmm. 255.255.255.0. Uh, do show IP interface brief, and we can see that that loopback is up. It's definitely higher than 192, but if I do a show IP protocols, we can see that the router ID is still 192.168.3.1. Now, if I did want the router ID to be 200, I'd have to do a clear IP OSPF process, and that resets the OSPF process and all the adjacencies reform. So now if I do a show IP protocols, I can see, uh, didn't do it. That's weird. Uh, let's try that one more time. Do clear IP OSPF process. Uh, reset. Yes. All right. Let me see. Show IP interface brief. Yeah, it's up, up. Show IP protocols. That's really strange. Why isn't it resetting? Definitely should be resetting. Show IP OSPF neighbor. Oops. It may be because we don't even have any adjacencies yet. But let me try one more time. Reset all OSPF processes. Yes. Show IP protocols. Yeah. Uh, that's strange. I mean, I've never seen that before. Uh, it, we don't have adjacencies, so that could be re uh, uh, what's related to that. Uh, the fact that we may have OSPF configured, but we haven't formed any adjacencies. Uh, but let's go ahead and leave that 200 in there for now. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and manually configure the router ID on router 2. I'm not going to manually configure it on router 3 because I want to continue to demonstrate that concept. So we go into router OSPF. Uh, and our process ID, and we simply just say router ID 2.2.2.2. .2 .2 .2. All right. Show IP protocols. Right, so that, yeah, go ahead. That, that was one of the reasons I asked the question was because uh, when you manually specify the router ID and then you go change it, then it does drop the adjacency. Yes. Uh, manually configured router IDs take precedence over every other router ID. Uh, now, it depends on the iOS, right? In the book, uh, specifically on page number 201, uh, you notice that they got a syslog message that said uh, you need to, or not a syslog message, just a, a message indicating that you need to use the clear IP OSPF process command for the new router ID to take effect. But we didn't do that in this case, and the router ID 2.2.2.2 became... Um, was used in the, uh, became the router ID immediately. All right. Um, we are having some adjacency problems, so we're going to have to go troubleshoot that, but that's good. I mean, it uh, wasn't intended to be part of the exercise, but it is good to be able to uh, potentially identify or, or to be able to troubleshoot because that's what you guys are going to have to do. All right. So just a recap. We use the router ID command if we want to manually configure the router ID. That will take precedence over every other router ID uh, uh, selection option. And the second selection option is the highest uh, IP address of all of the active loopback interfaces. Let me uh, distinguish that because when I say active, I mean in an up-up state. We don't mean that it's running OSPF. The, address, the interfaces that are being used for identifying the router ID do not actually have to be running OSPF for them to be a candidate for the router ID. Uh, so um, 
that's uh, that's one of the options. And then, of course, the last option is the highest IP address um, on all our, our non-loopback interfaces. All right. So uh, after this three-step process, the router ID is going to be selected. We want that router ID to be stable. So usually, I, I, I generally try to make the router ID. Uh, man, I usually try to manually configure the router ID because I want it to be predictable. I want it to be something that I know is going to be designated and it's going to be consistent in the design. So we typically will set the router ID manually in that particular case. Uh, once that OSPF router ID does get selected, uh, even if the interface that, that, that was used to select it originally goes down, uh, that router ID still main, uh, is maintained as that router ID unless the router reboots or you clear the OSPF routing process. All right. We can verify the router ID like what I did here by just simply doing a show IP protocols. Kind of got it wrapped around here, but uh, this is the output of the show IP protocols. We can see we're running OSPF process ID number two. Uh, the router ID in this case is 2.2.2.2. A couple of other things since we're already looking at this. I can see that the number of areas on this router is one. Uh, we'll talk about what a stub area is and what a not so stubby area is later on. Maximum pass four, that's pretty typical for an IGP protocol. Uh, specifically an IPv4 IGP protocol, uh, is that uh, we're going to have a maximum pass of four. That's our load balancing limitation. We can exceed that amount if we need to. Uh, but, uh, but in the case of most uh, designs, four PAS is, uh, is usually enough. All right. Again, it can go up to 16 PAS, maybe even more than that, depending on the operating system. And then I can see routing for networks. Uh, in this case, uh, it, it allows me to identify that I've actually used network statements to implement OSPF. And it even shows me essentially what those network statements look like because the way it's displayed on the screen here is actually how it was implemented. Remember, I didn't use network statements on router number uh, three. So if I do a show IP protocols here, you'll notice that rather than routing on routing for networks, we have routing for interfaces, meaning that I went into the interface and explicitly configured OSPF directly on the interface. Uh, and then we see uh, in the case of routing information sources, this already tells me that I'm not getting any neighborships because I don't see any routing information sources, but this would basically be all of my neighbors that I would have. Uh, and um, uh, we've obviously got to troubleshoot and figure out why we're not why we're not seeing adjacencies here. I should definitely be seeing something with router number one, right? So uh, show IP OSPF neighbor is going to show us that that we don't actually have a neighbor relationship. So let's go investigate what's going on on router number one. Show run. Uh, actually, let's do this quick. Show IP interface brief. Oh. Brief. There we go. Uh, so we got Ethernet 1.0, Ethernet 1.1, and Serial 2.0. So let's do a quick show run interface Ethernet 1.0 uh, and show interface Ethernet 1.1 and finally Serial 2.0. Oops, not Ethernet, Serial. All right. So let's. Certainly, we should be able to troubleshoot what's going on with show run pipe in uh, section OSPF. We should definitely be able to identify what's going on with uh, the adjacencies on the Ethernet side. Area 2, Area 1. Interesting. So we've got to figure out what's going on here. How come I don't have an adjacency? Serial 2.0 is in area 1. It should be running frame relay. Uh, serial, uh, excuse me, Ethernet 1.0 is in area 2. Uh, and that's really just a back-to-back -back Ethernet cable. Uh, even though there's a cloud there, it's not really a cloud. It's just a part of the diagram. Uh, 
So let's take a look at that link first. Um, see if we have any adjacencies on router one. Uh, let me get back to router one. Uh, show IP OSPF neighbor. Actually, let's do this. This is what I would do if I, if I had some suspicions about whether OSPF was running on an appropriate interface. One of the commands that I would run is just to show IP OSPF interface. Uh, actually, let's do the brief version first. Uh, and I can see that uh, actually uh, it is running on serial 2.0, uh, process ID number one, area one. It is running on Ethernet 1.0, uh, has an IP address and a subnet mask. Those look like the correct addresses. The costs are there. Uh, I do see something interesting on, well, Ethernet 1.1 looks okay. In fact, Ethernet 1.1, I can see that I have two adjacencies. So it looks like that one's okay. So what is it about Ethernet 1.0? All right. Uh, it's in area two. So that should be router number three. Did I mistype show IP OSPF interface? Ah, brief, brief, brief. Uh, Ethernet 1.0. Um, interesting. 3.2. Uh, let's go back to router one. Ah, we get some some things wrong with IP addresses here. Notice here that this is uh, 3.2 and 3.1, but on uh, on router number one, we've got some weird subnet addresses here that that don't correspond to what we're supposed to be seeing. So I think router three maybe has the wrong configuration. Um, Let's see, router three is supposed to be, the loopback is 3.1, but the ethernet is supposed to be 13.2. All right, well that should fix that problem. Let's go back and change that on router number three. Uh, this should be 13.2. Ethernet one zero, yeah. Interface ethernet one zero, IP address. 192, or sorry, 172, 16, 13.2, 255, 255, 255, 255, 255. Uh, my my uh, saved configurations must have been incorrect. So uh, let's go ahead and do a ping. Oh, well, we don't have to do that now because we just got an adjacency. All right, so that's good. Now let's go over to router number two because I want to make sure show IP OSPF interface brief. There's always multiple ways that you can kind of skin the cat here, so to speak, uh, and um, you know different ways to verify functionality. So we see 12.1 here, but I noticed something here. This says point to point, but on router number two, it says DR. So uh, this is something that we're definitely gonna be talking about later on and I did not do this intentionally, but it is a really important concept. Uh, within OSPF, OSPF uh, treats NBMA networks kind of differently than other types of networks. But uh, in any case, there are basically six different types of networks that OSPF recognizes. Broadcast, non-broadcast, multi-access, point-to-point, point-to-multi-point, uh, uh, loopback, and point to multipoint non broadcast. So if I did a show IP OSPF interface, serial 20, I can see that in this case, OSPF is recognizing this interface as non broadcast. And we can even see the timers on this interface are 30 and 120. Uh, but if I go into router number one and I do a show IP OSPF interface serial, Two zero, in this case, it's point to point, and the timers are ten and forty. Uh, now, if I do a show run interface serial two zero, you'll see that we actually specified the network type under the interface. All right, because it's frame relay, OSPF automatically assumed that this was a non-broadcast network. 
But if I do a show frame relay map, I can see that uh, eh, I can see that broadcasts are actually supported over this frame relay PVC. So I don't want OSPF to think this is a non-broadcast network. I want it to think that it's a point-to-point -point serial link. So I had to actually specify the network type. I could certainly take off this command from this interface and it would end up going to non-broadcast just like we see on this router here. But non-broadcast means no automatic neighbor discovery, uh, which means I would have to manually configure my neighbors as well. So what I need to do is basically just change this serial interface to point to point, the network type to point to point. So I'm gonna go into interface serial 20, IP, OSPF, network, and you can see these are the options. This particular iOS uh, doesn't allow me to set loopback. The loopback was one of the ones I mentioned, uh, and it also doesn't support point to multipoint non-broadcast. That's a kind of a special network type that isn't really used that much. It's not, I think it's actually been deprecated and they're kind of taking it out of iOS. But uh, so in this particular case, we're just going to go ahead and set it to point to point. Uh, and then what's going to happen is we'll get our adjacency because we're doing automatic neighbor discovery. And also the timers will match too. You'll notice here when the interface was referenced as non-broadcast, the timers were 30 and 120, but on point to point, the timers are 10 and 40. Unlike EIGRP, in OSPF, the timers have to match in order for us to form an adjacency between the two routers. So even if for some reason uh, I was able to send out neighbor discovery messages on that non-broadcast link, uh, I still wouldn't have formed an adjacency because the timers didn't match. The hello and dead timers didn't match. All right. So there's two ways to, to, to fix this problem. One would be to go ahead and, and simply change the network type which then allows it to have the same timers and also tells the router, hey, I'm going to go ahead and do a uh, DR, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and do a neighbor discovery. Uh, but, but there is another way to do this. You could actually just simply adjust the timers. Uh, let's see here. Config T, interface serial 20. Let's get rid of the network type. We'll lose our adjacency. IP, OSPF, hello interval, and we can change that to 10. The dead interval will automatically adjust to four times the hello interval. In OSPF, it's four times uh, the, the hello interval. Um, so if I did a do a show IP OSPF interface serial 20, I can see that now the timers are hello, uh, the hello is 10 and, and the dead timer is 40, which now matches this interface, right? Uh, the question is, do I, do I have an adjacency? do show IP OSPF neighbor and I do have an adjacency um, well I'm kind of stuck actually in a two-way state so I'm not I'm not forming my full adjacency we'll get into the different states that we go through so you can see that I was able to actually identify that the neighbor was there but I'm not able to go beyond uh, a two-way state because now uh, non-broadcast, I'm trying to do a DRBDR election, but on a point-to-point -point circuit, there is no DRBDR election. So the router on the right is trying to establish an adjacency and decide who's going to be the DR and the BDR. The router on the left, router number one, is set up to be point-to-point, -point, and on point-to-anything, point-to-multipoint, point-to-point, we don't do a DRBDR election. So Already we're starting to see, uh, and I know it's probably a little confusing because I'm kind of jumping around, but the point of this is not to understand those X, those, those components, right? The point is that OSPF is very finicky on, on uh, how it establishes adjacencies, and you have to be aware of how OSPF is interpreting the circuit type because the behavior of OSPF changes con uh, considerably based on that circuit type or that network type that we have. So uh, point to point links do not form, uh, do not um, allow us to uh, do a DR BDR election. It looks like it, we, we got a full adjacency here. Interesting. 
that's probably going to go down. Um, we got a full adjacency here with router one. So let me go into router one real quick uh, and see show IP OSPF neighbor uh, with router number two. So this is an interesting concept. Uh, this will this will most likely go down uh, because you can see here that we did form a full adjacency, but there is no DR BDR election from this router's perspective. I think what router number two did in this particular case is it said, you know what, uh, you're not responding to my request to identify a DR BDR. So I'm just going to go ahead and assume that you're the BDR and I'm going to become the DR for the link. Uh, and that allowed us to form an adjacency. The other part of this though, that you might be wondering, maybe possibly is, well, if, if router two believes that this is a non broadcast circuit, do show IP OSPF inter, uh, interface serial two zero. If OSPF thinks this is a non broadcast circuit, then that means that automatic neighbor discovery is not allowed. If both sides were non broadcast, we would never form an adjacency in this case because nobody's going to try and send out those multicast hello packets because they're assuming that those are not allowed on the circuit. But because the router on the left, router one, is not configured for non-broadcast, it's sending out the multicast hello packets. Router two is receiving those hello packets and it's recognizing that router one exists and it's forming a unicast relationship with router number one. We could do some debugs and stuff like that to, to identify um, the process that's taking place here. But uh, we're kind of getting a little bit off track for this particular exercise. I just wanted to make sure that you guys understood the, the, this concept that OSPF always tries to identify the type of circuit, the type of connection that's being used to communicate OSPF. And based on that, certain configuration components of that particular OSPF implementation are going to change. So let's go ahead and, and uh, get rid of, uh, let's do this the way I, I want to do it. Let's get rid of the timer. No IP OSPF hello interval. Uh, so it's going to go back to 40 seconds or 30 seconds, excuse me. And we're going to lose our adjacency eventually. And then let's just put in the network type of point to point. All right. So we get our adjacency went down, our adjacency came back up, show IP OSPF neighbor, and we have a, an adjacency. Now you can see that they're both kind of agreeing, hey, this is a point to point link. There's no reason to do a DR BDR election on this circuit. We haven't even talked about what a DR BDR election is yet. All right, but we will, we'll get into that. Now, um, in the book, the neighbors are not uh, they're actually doing a DR BDR election. So most likely in the case of the book, uh, we're just simply changing the network type to broadcast, which we can do. Actually, let's go ahead and do that uh, just to make sure it's consistent. So config T interface serial to zero IP OSPF, IP OSPF network broadcast. All right. And I'm going to do the same thing on router number one. Uh, this is going to be for serial 20 as well. Interface serial 20 IP OSPF network broadcast. Uh, now we should get our adjacency back. Um, and, uh, and then based on that, we should see a DRBDR election in this particular case. So show IP OSPF interface serial 20. Oops. And we can see that it's now considered to be broadcast. Hello and dead intervals are 10 and 40. So we're, we, we have a common configuration between both of the routers. And because the frame relay network is, is, uh, it supports multicast, we should see the adjacency come up. And it might take a little bit, but we should see the adjacency come up and then those routers will start communicating. Uh, let's do a quick show IP OSPF neighbor. There we go. And now we're seeing what we would typically see in the book, which is that not only we have a full adjacency, but we are also doing a DR BDR election uh, on the link. All right. I know that was a lot of information, uh, but this is already, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, 
a precursor to what's to come for the rest of these lessons because OSPF has a lot more going on with it than, than, um, than traditional EIGRP configuration. So it's definitely something you're either going to run into in the real world that you're going to have to manage uh, or it's something that you're, you know, obviously going to have to be aware of from a, a configuration perspective. So since we're already looking at the neighbor table, let's go ahead and break down what the neighbor table looks like. The neighbor ID in this particular case is the router ID. It's the actual router ID. Oh, uh, yeah, let's go back to router number three because we were talking about in router number three that, that um, uh, we were trying to clear the process so that loopback one, show IP interface brief, so that loopback one would become the router ID. So if I do a clear IP OSPF process now, let's see if it actually resets the adjacencies. Okay, it did. Now if I do a show IP protocols, uh, it still didn't change the router ID. That's really strange. It's really strange. It should definitely be changing unless show run pipe include section, uh, not include section, uh, section router. Uh, I just want to see if it's manually configured. No, it's not manually configured. That's really strange that it's not setting the router ID. Let's go ahead and set the router ID anyway so that all of our information is consistent. Uh, router OSPF3, router ID 3.3.3.3. Uh, there's that warning that we saw. Clear. Make sure you do the clear uh, IP OSPF process. Show IP protocols. Show IP protocols. Uh, and it did not change the router ID. So let's do a clear IP OSPF process. And see if, uh, if we, we see our adjacencies go down. And should come back up. Show IP protocols now and the router ID did change. So that's really strange. Um, I would, uh, I'm just really uh, surprised. The loopback is up, it's got an IP address, highest active wins, 200 is higher than 192. Uh, I don't know, I'm stumped on that one. Uh, I know for a fact, it doesn't have to be part of the OSPF process for it to be selected as the router ID. Um, so I'm not sure why that particular loopback. Maybe it always uses loopback zero. Maybe. No, I mean I've I've done this a million times, and it's it's always the highest active loopback. Uh, um, it's it's I I don't want to you know use the age old excuse it's a bug in the iOS because that's what everybody always says when something doesn't work the way they expect it to. Um, so I'm gonna have to maybe do a little research on that and figure out why that's why that's happening um it's very interesting you haven't configured any networks or routing yet on r3 or yet, uh well we're running ospf certainly we're running ospf on ethernet one zero and on loopback zero we're not running ospf on loopback one but again it, it doesn't the, the interface the, well, re, the requirement well, yeah go ahead yeah so when you did the show ip protocols i was talking about something different excuse me when you did the show ip uh, uh protocols uh-huh uh, it said routing for networks and it was blank. Right, so because we, we explicitly configured OSPF on the interfaces in this example, right? Uh, okay. Remember, I said there's two ways. By, by specifying the point to point? No, sir. By going into the interface and actually enabling the process directly on the interface. Oh, okay. Uh, either way, you're allowed to do it either way, right? You can either use network statements or you can explicitly identify the process directly on the interface. Uh, and that's why we don't see routing for networks under the show IP protocols. But again, loopback one is up. It's operational. It should have been selected as the router ID. So uh, I'll take that offline and maybe play around with it and see if I can find out why, uh, why that loopback interface did not participate in that election process. But, so let's get back to our uh, neighbor table, show IP OSPF neighbor. Uh, so the, the neighbor ID is the router ID of the particular neighbor. Priority. Uh, you'll notice here that just about every router, that priority value is set to 1. Show IP 
OSPF neighbor, we can see priority one, priority one. I come into this router, show IP OSPF neighbor, and the priority is one in both of these cases. However, if I go to router one and I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, we will see, actually, I think in this case, because I changed it from point to point, we'll see priority one, priority one, priority one, priority one. Um, and the reason why is that uh, that is the default. The priority value is an 8-bit value. It goes from 0 to 255. Uh, and it is used to identify uh, the router that potentially could become a designated router in a multi-access network. Uh, I'm going to defer the discussion of DR and BDR for a little bit. It's, we're going to talk about it in this lesson, but uh, for the uh, that's what that priority column represents. It represents the priority that's used in the election process for DR and BDR elections. The higher the number, the more likely it is that you're going to become a designated router. Uh, and it is a value that you can configure on a per interface basis. I'll demonstrate that a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, the state represents essentially the state of the neighborship. Uh, and there are actually several different states that you can go through. Some of the primary states include the down state, the init state, the two-way state, the extart state, the loading state, excuse me, exchange state, loading state, and the full state. I kind of listed them in order. Uh, down, init, two-way, xstart, exchange, loading, and full. Uh, as full as the name kind of implies, it means that we're fully adjacent. We've, we've established our neighbor relationship. We've gone through the process of, of you know, electing a chief and exchanging link state information. And then finally, we're in a full state, meaning that we're fully converged. That's obviously what you'd like to see. However, it's not always what you're going to see. Uh, there is actually another state that is a stable state in OSPF. It's called the two-way state. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But certainly full is good. If you see anything like xstart here or exchange or loading, uh, then and it's consistently staying in those states or continually rotating through those states, that's not a good thing. That means that there's something definitely happening uh, between the routers. Uh, for example... Let's go into interface serial 2.0 and change the MTU to 1200 on this interface. And what will happen is my adjacency will go down, um, should go down. Actually, it may not in this case because of uh, frame relay. But let me see if it goes down. Actually, let's do it on the Ethernet side. That'll be quicker. Uh, interface serial 2.0, no IP MTU. Interface Ethernet uh, 10 IP MTU 1200. All right. So I'm changing the MTU size on my Ethernet interface. Uh, one of the things that has to match between the routers um, on a uh, subnet is the MTU. Uh, on a common network is the MTU. So we should see the neighbor relationship fail here. Let me do one other quick thing, show IP OSPF neighbor. Uh, so I don't have to wait for the dead timer. Let me just do a clear IP OSPF process and force it to kind of go through the process here. And uh, let's see. Loading, loading, that's four, five, three is detached. Uh, notice three hasn't come back up yet. So if I do a show IP... OSPF neighbor, you can see how three is stuck in the X start state. And if I scroll through it, you might actually see it kind of, re it'll, it'll go through different states uh, as time expires and it'll try and reestablish. So you don't want to see something other than two-way or full in this particular case because that means that uh, you're not in a stable state, right? 90% of the time it's going to be full. The other 10% 10, 10 of the time, it might be two-way. And I'll explain when you might see a two-way state consistently between different routers. But you definitely don't want to see an X-start state. Uh, so let's fix that. Interface Ethernet 1.0, no IP MTU. So by the way, that's one of the things that has to match between routers. 
um, in OSPF is the MTU. If the MTU doesn't match, you will not be able to form an adjacency. All right. There's some other things as well. The hello and dead timers have to match. The area ID for the interface has to match. If you're running authentication on the interface, obviously you're going to have to have the same authentication between the two different routers. Um, you know, and uh, that's about it. Uh, they do have to be in a common subnet as well. So let's do one more time. Show IP OSPF neighbor. So the dead time is how long I'm going to wait if I don't get a hello before I decide that you don't exist anymore. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the timer in OSPF is the hello timer is 10 seconds, unlike EIGRP where it's five seconds. And the um, dead timer is four times. By default, four times the hello timer. So you can see that I'm not going to pretty much go below 30 seconds in this case because as I hit that 30 second threshold, I get another hello and that takes me all the way back up to 40 seconds. All right. So that's what we're seeing on the dead timer. If I, that means if I miss four hello packets, I'm pretty much going to delete that neighbor and, and move on. All right. The address column represents the physical address on the neighbor's interface. So this is the actual IP address that I would use for a next hop as an example for routes that are that I'm learning from from that neighbor. And then finally the interface is my exit interface that I go out of to reach that particular neighbor. That's my local interface that I'm using to establish the adjacency with that that remote neighbor. One of the commands that we've already seen quite a bit of uh, is the show IP OSPF interface command. Uh, there's two ways that we can implement this command. A quick show IP OSPF interface brief will just give you an idea of what type of interface it is. We can see that the loopback interface is in process ID number two. It's in area one. That's the physical address. It has a cost of one. We'll talk about the metric in a little bit. The state is loopback, um, which means, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of mentioned that loopback is like a network type. It's not technically a network type, but OSPF does identify loopback interfaces individually. Uh, and um, there's something specific about that that I'll talk to you about a little bit later on. When, when OSPF recognizes an interface as a loopback, uh, how it treats that interface from a perspective of advertising routes and so on. Uh, but we can see our serial 2.0 interface. Um, it has a cost of 64. Uh, and uh, the address of 172.16.12.2. Uh, and it is the DR. This interface is the designated router interface for that broadcast domain. Remember, we changed our network type to broadcast in this particular case. Uh, and we have one neighbor. All right. Uh, F and C is uh, we're full and we're converged. Uh, with that particular neighbor. All right. So we can also look at the non-brief version of this output, which I think is really one of the most useful commands. Uh, I highly recommend that you use this on the troubleshooting test when you're troubleshooting an OSPF ticket uh, because it pretty much tells you everything you need to know about the OSPF process on a particular interface. We can see the data link layer and the physical layer status of the interface. We can see the IP address and the subnet mask. We can see what area the interface is in, what process ID is running. I can see the router ID for the router that's going to that's gonna be communicating on that interface. I see the network type. I can see the metric for the interface. Uh, uh, here again is the metric. I can also see who the DR and the BDR are on that particular broadcast domain. Uh, remember, this is defined as a broadcast domain, even though it is technically a point-to-point -point serial link. We tricked OSPF into thinking it's a broadcast network. So there is a DRBDR election. I can see the timers on the interface. Uh, I can see when the hellos are supposed to go out. I can even see, for example, if I have any adjacencies on that interface. If I'm suppressing hellos for a particular neighbor, meaning that it's a passive interface. Uh, and if authentication was configured, I would, because authentication in OSPF is enabled on an interface basis, I could even see whether or not authentication is, a, is applied as well. All right, so. Hey, hey, Scott, I thought you configured the interface as a point to point. I changed it. Oh, uh, okay. You missed that one. I was too fast for you. No, I changed it to broadcast. I changed it to broadcast because that's what they have in the book. 
Um, functionally, point to point works just fine, but I wanted to make sure that the uh, the outputs matched what was in the book itself. So, um, and uh, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, actually, in this case on router two, I don't know if you guys are looking at the book, but on page 203, they actually have it as non-broadcast. I'm not going to change it again. I think you guys get the idea of, of at least fundamentally, we're going to talk about it some more later on about these different network types. Okay, so let's now investigate our routing table. Uh, looks like we have full convergence, so I'm going to go into router number five. Uh, and I'm going to take a look at the routing table in router number five. One of the things that you can do if you have, you know, kind of a nice topology diagram and you have a, a good understanding of what's connected to what and what's part of OSPF is you can look at this topology and say, okay, uh, from router five's perspective, assuming that the loopbacks are, are being routed inside of OSPF, I should see, uh, let me see, one, OSPF route here, I should see number two OSPF route here, number three OSPF route here. Uh, there should be another OSPF route here. We're missing our, oh, there it is behind the cloud. Uh, we're missing our um, addressing information. So the 13 subnet there. Uh, and then I should see this network here. So that's one, two, three, four, five. I should see at least five OSPF routes in my router five routing table. Um, and so let's go take a look at that and see if that's the case. All right, show IP route, OSPF, and sure enough, there are five routes. One, two, three, four, and five. All right, uh, but you do notice that they don't all look the same. All right, one of the things that we're going to be talking about today, if not today, early tomorrow, uh, with regard to OSPF is how OSPF advertises routes in a multi-area design. Uh, you can see up in the key here, the code index, that we actually have several different types of OSPF codes. O is OSPF, IA is OSPF inter-area, and one is not so stubby uh, external type one routes, and two is not so stubby external type two, E1 is external type one, E2 is external type two. So there are actually five different codes that we have, um, actually six different codes in this case, that we have to identify different types of OSPF routes. I'm not gonna get into the differences here other than describing the two that we see in this table because we're gonna talk about special area types a little bit later on. O routes are routes that I'm learning inside of my area, within my area. So, uh, and that makes sense that the 4.1 route is coming from router four. That's the loop back that's on router four and router four is in the backbone area along with router five. OIA routes, those are called inter-area routes because they're coming from other areas. Uh, so an O route is like a type one LSA where an OIA route is a type three LSA. We'll get into the different LSA types a little bit later on. So I can see that I'm getting those four routes from outside of the area, uh, out, outside of area zero, and I'm getting um, the, the one route within the area. If I go into router one, for example, and I do the same thing, show IP OSPF, uh, show IP route OSPF, you will see that all of the routes in this case are O's, right? And the reason why is because R1 is participating in all the areas. So it's learning about all the routes uh, as a participant within the area, so these become in, intra-area routes as opposed to inter-area routes. So uh, pay attention to that as well when you're analyzing the routing table, and, and we are going to get into it in a lot more detail uh, with respect to how, how these networks are handled and, and what are the different LSA types and, and what are the different OSPF router codes, but um, O routes come from inside the area, OA routes are, are routes that are injected by an ABR from other areas. Um, and uh, one other thing that I want to point out here, you'll notice that the O route for the 4.1 network, all right, you notice that this, this route here, it, it, it indicates that it's a slash 32 prefix, which means a host route, all right? Uh, if I go to router four and I do a show IP interface brief, Actually, I'll, I'll do a show interface 
uh, or show run interface loopback zero, you can see that it's actually not configured as a host route. It's configured as a slash 24 prefix. All right. Uh, this is what OSPF does with loopback interfaces. If I do a show IP OSPF interface loopback zero, you can see that it's actually identified the network type as loopback. I remember I said that was the sixth network type, even though it's kind of technically not really a network type. Um, I mean, I guess it is, but it's not one that we can set interfaces to. Uh, OSPF, when it recognizes that an interface is a loopback, what it essentially does is says, you know what, there's no reason to advertise a quote unquote network for that interface because there's no hosts on that network. It's a loopback. So I'm just going to go ahead and advertise that as a slash 32 host route. We can override that behavior by going into the loopback interface and changing the OSPF network type, IP OSPF network type, uh, to some other network type. Usually I just use point to point um, and that's, uh, that's sufficient, right? Um, you could probably set it to broadcast or some other method, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just use point to point. So now when I come in here, I can actually see the prefix that was configured on the um, on the actual interface. Notice that previously it was showing up as a slash 32 host route uh, and in this particular case it's actually showing up with a prefix. It's not really that important, right? Because uh, really whether it's whether we're identifying the individual address on the interface or the network ID, there's only going to be one address that we're going to communicate to on that loopback anyway. Um, but always OSPF advertises loopback interfaces as a slash 32 host route and we can override that behavior by by changing that all right so another way of uh, observing the routes that exist in a routing table uh, or in a in a router instead of just doing a show IP route OSPF I can do a show IP OSPF route uh, show IP OSPF route. We didn't see this option with EIGRP. So what this does is this is very similar to like looking at a BGP uh, database. Um, we're, we're seeing the router ID for the router. The process ID is process 5 and this is my, my, my global routing table essentially. These are routes that I'm learning about within the backbone and these are routes that I'm learning about from an ABR and router one is the ABR in this case. So let's break this down a little bit. I can see that I have 172.16.145.0 slash 29. That's an intra area route. It has a cost of 10. It's in area zero and it's connected. We don't see a greater than symbol next to that route because the only reason a greater than symbol shows up is if the route is inserted into the routing table as an OSPF route. In this particular case, this route is not inserted into the routing table as an OSPF route because it's a connected route, which means it's going to show up in my routing table as a connected route because of the administrative distance of connected routes over, over OSPF routes. Uh, in this particular case though, this is not a connected route. Uh, it's being learned from 145.4 on Ethernet 1.0, it has a cost of 11. Uh, it's an intra area route. It is a valid route. That's what the asterisk means. It's a valid route, uh, but the greater than symbol means that it's actually been inserted into the routing table as a, as a route. Uh, and then we have our inter, intra area router path list. This indicates who the ABR is. Uh, this is how many times the shortest path first algorithm has been run. Uh, this is the, uh, the router ID for that, that ABR. This is the cost to reach the ABR. This is the physical IP address of the ABR. This is the exit interface that I go out of to reach the ABR and so on. And then these are all the routes that are being learned by the ABR. And they're identified as inter, meaning inter area routes as opposed to intra area routes. All right. So that's one way of uh, kind of analyzing the database. We're going to talk about cost 
Uh, we'll talk about how metrics are calculated, and there's a couple of other little gaps that we're going to fill in here as part of this process. But this is a really, really important concept. I don't actually really use this command that much. I just simply analyze the, the, the basic routing table. And I, I will, this is not, by the way, forgot to mention that, this is not the topology database. This is not the link state database. We don't use this command to see the link state database. Because remember, the link state database shows me everything that I'm learning. All right? Um, whereas this is actually showing me the routes that are, that are being used. All right? So if I, if I want to uh, troubleshoot an adjacency problem, one of the commands that I can use to troubleshoot an adjacency problem is a debug command. I can say, for example, debug IP uh, OSPF adjacency. All right, this is going to allow me to see the, the progression that I go through as I'm establishing an adjacency between the routers. So let's clear the IP, uh, OSPF process. And we will now see all of the different stages that the routers go through in order to actually form their full adjacency. All right, let's do an undebug all. All right. So if I scroll up here, you can see that I start in the down state. All right. Uh, the interface goes down. Uh, the neighbor change went down. Uh, we lost the neighbor. Uh, and then I start to go back through the election process. So here's officially where uh, the neighbor is dead, the neighbor state is down. All right. Now you'll notice here that uh, once the interface comes up, interface is going up, I start to progress through my uh, adjacency. Uh, actually, two-way is not the first state, state in that adjacency process. We didn't see the other ones. But the two-way communication means that, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you what it means right now. We're going to talk about that. But basically, it means that I have to say something, right? Uh, it basically means that both routers recognize each other. They're not, they haven't, they're not exchanging routing information. They're not even, they haven't even determined whether or not they even want to exchange routing information. But they at least recognize each other. They recognize that they're in a common subnet. They recognize they're in a common area, and that they can actually communicate to each other. Okay. Then we do our DR BDR election. We can see that happening here. I'm going to elect the BDR. Uh, I'm going to elect the DR. Uh, the DR becomes this router. The BDR becomes this router. We're going to talk about what that is and what that means uh, in the case of uh, multi-access networks. Uh, and then I go into the next phase, which uh, means that I start exchanging my database descriptor packets. All right. And by the way, I've now moved from the two-way state into the XStart state. All right. And in this XStart state, we're kind of negotiating. You can kind of see that here. We're negotiating who is going to be the chief for managing the exchange of information between these routers. Uh, so this router became the master in that negotiation process. The other router became the slave. Uh, so that, that just identifies, in this particular case, who's going to be responsible for uh, negotiating the exchange of information and, and processing the exchange of information. So now we move from that XStart state into the, so we're still in the XStart state here, then we move into the exchange state. Also notice, by the way, all of these packets, the DBDs, I received a DBD, uh, we've got some, some flags that are set, a sequence number, uh, sorry, uh, options that are set of sequence numbers, some flags, packet length, but here's where the MTU is specified. So during this process of negotiating our adjacency, the MTU is actually being sent back and forth. And that's, that's where you would potentially stay in that, that XStart state, because we see the MTU is also exchanged here uh, in, the, in the process of moving from the two-way state to the XStart state. Uh, this is the first time that I would identify whether or not our MTUs match. And, that's why we would end up staying in that XStart state if the MTUs don't match in this particular case. So the exchange state, you might think, well, OK, the exchange state means that we're actually exchanging routing information. It's not true. 
in the exchange state, we're exchanging um, the uh, uh, data, data, additional database descriptors. It's actually when we get to the loading state is when we start. We don't see the, the transition from exchange to loading here. It's not identified. But actually in this process, right here, these two lines right here, we're actually in the loading state. Loading means that we're actually sending and receiving routing information to each other, uh, back and forth to each other. And then finally, once that process is done, then we move into the full state. Okay, uh, So that's what we're seeing in this particular case. We're seeing that process of, of going through all these different states and identifying you know, what, uh, you know, what, what state uh, a router needs to be in or, you know, the, the different steps that are occurring as I'm going through these different states. We're going to see this again. So don't worry if you didn't catch any of that. If you kind of, uh, gosh, there's so much stuff going on here. Uh, we're going to see this again uh, later on in this lesson about, you know, all of these different, different states that we move through and what the purpose of those states are and so on. All right. Uh, so let's get uh, through some of our slides here because we got a little bit behind. Uh, we've been doing everything in command line, so we'll just kind of get through some of these slides here. There's the router ID configuration process, clearing the OSPF process. Uh, there's show IP protocols to verify router ID. Uh, show IP OSPF neighbor to verify your neighbor relationships. Uh, show IP OSPF interface to verify the status of your OSPF interfaces. Um, show IP route to verify the O routes as well as the OIA routes. Uh, what else? We've got uh, show IP OSPF route. We went through that. Uh, another way of analyzing the routing database. Uh, and this is a continuation of the previous slide there. Uh, and then we just did our debug, right? And we went through the process of kind of looking at all the different states that the router is going through as it as it gets into its full state. DBD, exchange, xstart, exchange, loading, full, and so on. Okay. Uh, by the way, that's what it says here, right? It says, I went from loading to full. All right. Remember, loading is the process of sending and receiving. Uh, so this guy sent a link state request. This guy sent a link state update. All right. Uh, that's that's what we define essentially as the loading state. The exchange state, uh, which is a little bit confusing, right? Because the exchange state is the process of sending and receiving DVDs. So it says the state is exchange here as part of this communication. But we, you know, it would kind of make more sense if I saw exchange starting... You know, if I was kind of trying to troubleshoot this in progression, the C exchange app, you know, kind of identified before we sent the DVDs. Uh, but uh, you can see that there's several different states that we're going through in this particular case. One of the things that we need to talk about is the concept of DR and BDR. All right. Uh, DR and BDR, designated router and backup designated router. When it comes to OSPF, as far as optimizing the behavior of OSPF, one of the things that's part of the process is to go through something called a DR-BDR election process. It's not something that you necessarily can control. Uh, I mean, there are certain elements of the DR-BDR election process that you can maybe influence so that you can decide which router becomes the DR-BDR. But the process of the, the actual election process is going to happen regardless. Okay, uh, this election process occurs on uh, multi-access networks, uh, specifically things like a broadcast network, like an Ethernet network, or even a multi-access non-broadcast network, like an MBMA network, um, like Frame Relay. All right. Uh, essentially, what you have, and and probably the, the the physical topology on the left here is probably the easiest one to understand, is you've got a bunch of routers that share a common subnet. They're in a, in a common broadcast domain. And normally what would have to happen in this particular case is I would have to establish adjacencies across the board. If this was EIGRP, every router would form a full adjacency with every other router in that link. But because of the amount of information and because of the uh, 
the, the level of information that's being exchanged between the routers in an OSPF domain, the makers of OSPF decided that what we're going to do instead is uh, we want to have a process that's going to allow us to reduce the amount of routing update traffic that's going to occur on the network. Uh, and we also have, we want to have a way of managing all of the synchronization of this uh, uh, information across this multi-access network. So what they did is they said, let's go ahead and elect a chief for that multi-access network and we'll call that chief a designated router. And then of course we need to have a backup in case the, the chief is no longer available to process information, then we need to have a backup and uh, and the backup is is going to obviously take over if the primary designated router fails. Okay, so all that being said, uh, we do this DRBDR election process. Uh, that DRBDR election process is based on two different values. It's based on the priority for that particular network segment. Whoever has the highest interface priority. Uh, we already know that the default interface priority for OSPF routers is one. That's a, con con a configurable value in, in your OSPF configuration. And uh, secondly, router ID. Uh, if the priorities are tied, we're going to use the router ID as a, as a uh, tiebreaker. So let's go into router number one real quick and let's take a look at what this looks like from the router's perspective in the election process. All right, let me drop into router number one here. And I'm just going to do a quick show IP OSPF neighbors. And I can see here that the priority is in fact one on all the interfaces. I can see the state of these neighbor relationships, BDR, DR, DR, BDR. So what this is essentially telling me is what the role of my neighbor is. This is not my role to the neighbor, this is the role of my neighbor. So router four is a BDR for that broadcast domain. Router five is a DR for the, the 145.5 broadcast domain. Router two is a DR for that serial link. And router three is a BDR for that ethernet link on the bottom. All right, if I do the same thing, say on router four, right? Router four is acting as a BDR. So I can come into router four and I can do the same thing on router four, show IP OSPF neighbor, and I can see that router one, excuse me, router five is the DR, which actually corresponds to what we saw over here. Router five is the DR. Uh, and, but in this case, router one is, is called a DR other. So essentially router one is basically not a DR, it's not a BDR, which means it's something else. Well, the only other thing it could be is maybe something other than a DR. Uh, and that's what we're basically stating here. If we go back to the topology diagram, we're talking about the relationship within this broadcast domain, right? There's a DR BDR election that's occurring here. Because I configured this serial link, this frame relay serial link as a, as a broadcast, there's a DR BDR election here. And because this is Ethernet, which also is a broadcast type network, there's a DR BDR election here. Uh, and that's why we're seeing so many different elections taking place. Now, the way that the election occurs is the router that has the highest interface priority within the broadcast domain is going to become the DR. But since all the routers have the same priority, there needs to be a tiebreaker. And in this particular case, the tiebreaker is the router with the highest router ID. Kind of makes sense, right? Router five would become the DR in this particular scenario because router five does have the highest router ID. 5.5.5.5 uh, for this router, as opposed to 1.1.1.1 here and 4.4.4.4 here, all right? Have we talked about what a DR and a BDR is? Yes, we just did. Um, but I'll explain it again because uh, um, it's, uh, it's an important concept to understand. So basically what happens in this case, so we've, we've already identified that router five is the DR for this particular network, all right? For this, for this broadcast domain, router five is the DR. So router one forms a full adjacency with router five. 
router four forms a full adjacency with router five. Let me uh, let me do this because uh, I want to be able to draw on this. So let me just grab a snip of this network here. All right. So we've we've identified that uh, router five is the DR in this case. We're going to form a full adjacency with that router. We're going to form a full adjacency with that router. And if there are any topology changes on router four, or if there are any topology changes on router one, rather than router one directly exchanging that information with router four, router one is going to send that information down to router five, and then router five is going to be responsible for disseminating that information to all the other routers on that segment that it's acting as a DR for. So it becomes a central point of configuration. It becomes a central point of disseminating information, topology changes, and so on. Uh, in this example here, we could see that the impact would be even greater if this router on the bottom left is the DR, then all the routers form an adjacency with that DR. And any kind of exchange of topology information goes through the DR to the other routers. So we're reducing the size, reducing the number of adjacencies that have to take place, the number of full adjacencies that have to take place, and we're actually kind of uh, uh, centralizing or controlling the, uh, the process of, of managing topology change information. So this is a synchronized topology. The, this router is the DR, and these two routers, for example, on the bottom, the ones I'm pointing to here, those might become DR others, which means they're going to form a two-way state. They're going to know that they exist. They're going to know that they're in the same broadcast domain and that they could potentially become full neighbors at some point, but they're going to stay in the two-way state uh, while, they're, uh, while they're exchanging information through the DR. Does that make sense? So that's really the goal and that's the objective of, of this process. So we're looking at router one, router four, and router five. These are the three routers in that broadcast domain. Router 5 is the DR. Router 4 is the BDR. Mathematically, that makes sense because they all have the same priority. So we go based on router ID. Highest router ID wins. I become the DR. Second highest router ID becomes the BDR. And you'll notice that router 1 becomes a DR other. Now, I still have a full state to router 1. And the reason I still have a full state to router one is because uh, I am a DR or a BDR. And the DRs and BDRs always form a full adjacency with everybody else within the broadcast domain. There's never a, a case where that won't happen. However, if I had a fourth router in this broadcast domain, then two of those routers out of the four were good, are going to simply stay in the two-way state. They're both going to be DR others and they're not going to form a full adjacency with each other. Okay. There are a couple of things about this process that I want to point out though. So you can see in this case that they're actually shutting down the ethernet interface on router five. I'm going to go ahead and do that. But before I do that, I want to, I want to do one other thing real quick. All right. Uh, I'm going to go into router four. And I'm going to go into the interface. Uh, let me see, do show IP interface brief. And I'm going to go into the Ethernet interface that's participating to, in that network, Ethernet 1.0. And I'm going to say IP OSPF priority. And you can set the priority from 0 to 255. Now, if I were to set the priority of 0, a priority of 0 means that you can never be elected as the DR or BDR. So there may be an instance where you say this router's old, it doesn't have a lot of CPUs, uh, doesn't have a lot of memory. Uh, I don't want this router acting as the DR for this segment. So I can give it a priority of zero so that it can never be elected. But let's say I set the priority to 100, which is a higher priority than one. If I do a show IP OSPF interface Ethernet 1.0, I can see that the priority is set to 100. Uh, and if I go into router number five, if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, I in fact see that change. All right. Well, didn't we just say that the highest priority becomes the DR? 
And if there's a tie, then we go to router ID. But yet router four is still a BDR. And that is because the election process is non preemptive. We want to make sure that we have stability in our network. We want to make sure we have stability in our network. So we don't want arbitrary changes in the network because if, if, I, if I change my role from the BDR to the DR, or if I change my role from a DR other to a DR, that means I have to reform adjacencies. That means I have to go back and rebuild adjacencies and I have to do my recalculations on my database. So essentially, it's like I'm almost kickstarting the OSPF process all over again. I don't want to have to do that, right? So uh, they decided that in, in, in uh, this election process that we're going to make it non-preemptive, uh, meaning that even if somebody comes along with a better value, they're not going to be, they're not going to take over the role of the DR or the BDR. Uh, and there's a reason why that's particularly important. I'll mention that in a second. So uh, now if I do go into interface Ethernet uh, 1.0, config T, uh, let's try that again. I went off the screen there. Doo -doo, where the heck is it? Got too many windows open again. Config T, interface Ethernet 1.0, and I shut down the interface. All right. Now, obviously, I'm going to lose my role as the as the DR. I was the DR. And if I do a no shut on the interface and I get my adjacencies back, you will notice that I've lost my status. If I do a show IP OSPF interface, uh, neighbor, excuse me, show IP OSPF neighbor. I can see, uh, well, we're still negotiating. Uh, let's see, we're not... Yeah, we, we're not neighbors yet. There we go. Now we're neighbors. So I can see that router four became the DR and router one got promoted from a DR other to the BDR, even though uh, I have the highest router ID. Now you might say, well, I don't have the highest priority, but it doesn't matter. Once I lose my state, whether the router reboots or an interface goes down or whatever, whoever's next in line takes over the role and I don't preempt that role when I come back. All right, that's that's very helpful because if we end up having a uh, if we end up having a situation where we have uh, you know a router that's flapping or an interface that's flapping, a router that's going up and down, I don't want to have to constantly reconverge and change the DR BDR status uh, between the routers. All right. But here's another important concept to this, and this is why we generally don't concern ourselves with who's the DR and the BDR, especially in a multi-access network. If I would have happened to configure router one first in this domain, I pasted router one's configuration third. I started by pasting router five's config, then I pasted router four's config, then I pasted router one's config. Had I pasted router one's config first and, and brought the OSPF process up on router one first, it would have become the DR by default because it was the only router that was running OSPF on the multi-axis network. And then if I would have pasted router four, it would become the BDR and then router five would have been the DR other. So I guess my point is, is that you don't really have control over the election because once somebody gets elected, the only way to force that election to happen again is to basically bring that router down. Uh, you don't really want to be doing that in a production environment. So the only way to actually truly identify whether or not a router could become a, a DR or a BDR uh, or not is to set the priority to zero. Uh, that's the only real control you have because that would then uh, ensure that that router would never become a DR or a BDR. Does that make sense? Uh, now, if I were to go into a point-to-point -point serial link, right? So if I come over to router two here as an example, and let me do a show IP interface brief. Show IP interface brief. Whew. All right, serial two zero. And I change the OSPF network type, IP OSPF network point-to-point. -point, uh, and I've got to do the same thing on router one. <clears throat> All right, uh, enable show IP interface brief. I believe that was also two zero. Yeah, config T interface serial two zero IP 
OSPF network point to point. <clears throat> so now I've set the network type to point to point on both links. If I do a show IP OSPF neighbor now, you can see that the state says, first of all, the priority was automatically set to zero. Uh, I didn't change the priority. It changed the priority by changing the network type. And for the state, we see a dash. Uh, the dash basically means that there is no DRBDR election. Remember what the purpose of a DRBDR election is. The purpose is to ensure that we reduce the number of adjacencies that we have to have and add efficiency to the communication process on the, on the network. How can I reduce the number of adjacencies I have on a point-to-point -point link? right? Uh, there's only two routers. So by default, OSPF, if it was truly point to point, like literally a back to back serial cable, uh, OSPF would simply not do a DRBD or election on that on that link, because I tricked OSPF into thinking, this is a point to point link, uh, it, it went ahead and and um, set the uh, uh, priority to zero and said, we're not going to do a DRBD or election on this on this link. Does that make sense? Um, there's no, there's no need to. We can't reduce the number of adjacencies that we have on that, on that, that interface. All right. So we can modify the priority. This is the example where they shut down the interface to see that R, uh, well, R1, R4 became the DR, and then uh, they did a no shut again to bring it back up, and how R5 lost its status, uh, and then we're verifying the same thing on the other two routers, right? Who's the DR and who's the BDR? One of the fields in the OSPF hello packet is a field that allows us to identify the DR BDR election process. And like I said, it's an 8-bit value, which means it can go from 0 to 255. And in, uh, the, the, the default value is a 1. And we manually change that at the interface level by using the IP OSPF priority command. I demonstrated that concept. Uh, <clears throat> the router with the highest priority on the interface within the domain, within the broadcast domain, is going to be elected as the DR, assuming it's the first router that you start. <laughs> you know, that's what's really strange about this election process. Because it's non-preemptive, if I happen to configure a router, one router first, all right, if I happen to configure one router first, and it happens to have a lower priority than the next router I configure, it's still going to be the DR because I just configured it first. So even though we talk about this election process, it, it really doesn't happen this way because it really depends on when the routers become active in the domain and when they recognize each other. All right. The router with the highest priority is going to be elected as the DR. If there's a tiebreaker, the router uh, with the, uh, the highest router ID is then going to become the DR. And then consequently, the router with the the second highest priority and the second highest router ID would become the BDR. If I have a router that has a priority set to zero, it can never be elected. Uh, and the, uh, a router that's not the DR or the BDR is simply called a DR other. All right. So we use the IP OSPF priority command. I already demonstrated that process uh, on, I didn't do it on router one, I did it on router four but you set the priority on a per interface basis. Uh, now notice what they did here is that they cleared the process on router four because router four was the DR. Router one was already the BDR. So by default, router one would have become the DR anyway, even if I didn't change the priority because it was next in line in the election process. But uh, nonetheless, that's what they're trying to demonstrate here is the concept that uh, that router became the, the, B, the DR after that, after that process was done. So what we're seeing here in this uh, show IP OSPF interface command, again, something I already demonstrated is we can see who the DR is for that particular network, that broadcast domain. And that's important, by the way, guys. This election process happens not within an area not within an autonomous system, but for every single broadcast network that exists within the topology. So you could have potentially, well, I mean, any kind of number of DRs or BDRs throughout your entire autonomous system. It just depends on how many uh, 
actual broadcast domains you might have. So show IP OSPF interface, Ethernet 01, we can see that the DR is router 1, uh, that the BDR is router 5, my current state is DR, my current priority is 100, and then I can see also who my neighbors are, and it's even identifying right here that the neighbor 5.5.5.5 is the BDR. All right. Uh, another aspect Thanks, that... Scott. Yes, sir, go ahead. doing here uh, they don't match up like I don't even see anything on DRs BDRs in the material that was provided um, by Firefly it's the Cisco learning you know uh, student lab and, uh, and whatever else the other thing is called but uh, it doesn't have any of these DR BDR slides in it so it, can we get those slides by chance um, I will do you one better hold on one second so one of the things that we've already seen as part of the process of configuring OSPF in this particular discovery is that OSPF likes to try to interpret what type of network it's attached to and then based on that interpretation it makes decisions on how to treat that particular link whether it's a broadcast link, non-broadcast, multi-access, whatever. By default, frame relay connections are automatically treated as NBMA networks which means non-broadcast multi-access. Uh, ATM is another example of a frame relay type network. Uh, however, even though it's identified as non-broadcast, OSPF tries to treat that network like it's a broadcast environment, like it's Ethernet. So it's going to try and do a DRBDR election, and it's going to try and uh, uh, you know, form that, those, those types of adjacencies based on that. Well, that'll be a problem if for some reason the spoke routers become the DR because the spoke routers in this particular topology don't have direct connections to each other. They have to go through the hub. So the solution for this is to make sure that the hub router acts as the DR and that the spoke routers never become candidates for uh, uh, as a DR or a BDR, as a DR or BDR. And because this is a non-broadcast domain, because it's actually technically supposed to be non-broadcast, we can't do automatic neighbor discovery so we would have to configure our neighbors manually. This is what that would look like. I'm not going to do that configuration in, in our particular example, but uh, this is what it would look like based on this topology right here. So spoke one and spoke two would be R4 and R5 respectively. So we're going to set the priority of the interfaces for those particular routers to zero. And we already know what that means. That means that they're not going to be elected as the DR or the BDR. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to do that in the case of our, our particular topology um, because we're not, we, we want that multi-axis network to have the DR, BDR election process. All right. Um, another important aspect, which I also demonstrated, was the concept, oh, and this is them showing that the priority was propagated uh, and that this router became a DR other, this router became a DR other because they cannot be the DR. You actually technically don't have to have a BDR. Uh, there's no requirement that says a BDR must exist, but obviously if you don't have a BDR and the DR fails, you're gonna, have, you're gonna lose all your adjacencies and you're not gonna be able to communicate. Another aspect of which I actually demonstrated is this uh, idea of MTU. Uh, the MTU parameter determines essentially how much data I can encapsulate inside of a datagram before I send it out of an interface without some sort of fragmentation happening, right? It's a little bit different than MSS. MSS is something that we look at at layer four. It's called maximum segment size, but they are directly related to each other, the MTU and the MSS. If a packet with an MTU uh, arrives at a, uh, an MTU size arrives at an interface uh, and, and we have exceeded the interface MTU, then we're just simply gonna start to fragment that packet or we're going to discard the packet if that bit in the, in the IP header is marked, that do not fragment bit is marked in the IP header. Remember, an IP header is, uh, we didn't really get into this. I, I talk a lot about this in my CCNA class, but uh, an IP header is the, uh, the, the, the version field. Then we have a header link field. Then we have the to toss byte or DSCP field, packet uh, header length field. And then we have the three fields that are related to fragmentation.
uh, fragmentation offset, flags, and identification. Uh, within that flag field, and then after that we have time to live, we have protocol, and, and so on and so on, and checksum and, and everything else. But uh, within that, uh, fla that flag field, we have one flag that's called the DF flag, do not fragment flag, and that's what allows us to identify whether or not a packet can be fragmented or not, all right? Uh, OSPF packets uh, obviously rely on IP for transport because there is no tr TCP component, there's no UDP component. Uh, there, you can fragment OSPF packets. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, but uh, you definitely cannot have mismatched MTUs between neighbors. Uh, we already saw, and I already demonstrated this concept, and they're they're going through the book and they're demonstrating that concept as well. Uh, if there is an MTU mismatch, what's going to end up happening is that the routers are are going to get stuck in the X start state, and they're not going to be able to go beyond that X start state uh, to, 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 to move into the full state or the, um, or the uh, uh, you know, even a two-way state, right? Um, well, actually, X start is after two-way, so we've already, be, we've already moved beyond the two-way state, uh, but there is the potential. I mean, there's, there's never going to be an opportunity for us to go to an exchange state and a loading state and a full state. X start is where we're going to stay. All right. Now there's two ways to deal with that. I guess I will demonstrate this because I didn't show you guys this earlier. Um, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing here on router 3's ethernet interface. I'm going to change the MTU on router 3's ethernet interface and, and reset the OSPF process. Oh. I don't want to do that. I need to make IP, no IP domain lookup part of the configuration. For some reason the break sequence doesn't work very well on GNS3. So we'll just wait. All right. No IP domain dash lookup. Oops. There we go. All right, so uh, let me do a show IP interface brief. Mm. Still can't type, though. All right, and uh, Ethernet 1.0. So interface, Ethernet 1.0, IP, MTU, 1200. And you might, you might adjust the MTU. It's actually pretty common. Uh, for example, if you're doing GRE tunneling or GRE encapsulation, if you're running a DMVPN with OSPF, uh, you need to adjust the MTU size to account for the GRE headers and the IP, IPsec headers and so on. So let's, let's kill our OSPF process. All right, so the neighbor has now gone down, and we know that it's going to get stuck in this X start state uh, with router 1. Now, I can actually go into router 1. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily recommend this. I would suggest that you fix the MTU problem, but you can actually go into router one. Let me make sure I've got the right interface again. Uh, Ethernet uh, one zero. And I can actually say IP OSPF MTU ignore. So I can say, okay, you know what? Um, I, I want to ignore uh, an MTU mismatch uh, that I receive on this particular interface. I'm, I would have to probably do this on both sides. I'm not sure if I have to do it on both sides or not. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I would because this router is ignoring it, uh, but the other router is still saying, you know what, our MTUs don't match. So let me do that on this interface as well. IP OSPF. MTU, ignore. So what I'm saying essentially is, you know what, I'm going to simply ignore the fact that our MTUs don't match, and I'm going to go ahead and force the adjacency to take place. That means that we could potentially have fragmentation, or if packets are being generated with the do not fragment bit set, they're going to get dropped. So it's actually really better to fix the MTU problem than to simply ignore the MTU problem. Um, that's kind of actually usually a general general recommendation in life in, in, in general. But 
Um, so just make sure that you understand the, the, the impact of mismatched MTUs on your interfaces. All right. <clears throat> Another... Uh, now, uh, I, I got a question about that. Is that what's configured on the interface or just what's being transmitted? So like, like you said, some kind of encryption or... or... Uh, it's what's configured, right? So if you do a show interface on a router, it's what shows up under the show interface is what the MTU is. So you can see MTU is actually identified on the physical interface. Uh, let me go to the one that I changed right here. Uh, was this the side I changed? Uh, this isn't the side that I changed. But anyway, it's whatever shows up under the show interface. That's what's being um, transmitted. Okay, It's not actually identifying how much data or how much space is available um, for or how much data is being used to encapsulate the datagram. It's basically just like bandwidth and delay and everything else. It's whatever's configured on the interface is what's going to affect the, uh, the actual value. Okay. Uh, good question, by the way. All right. So uh, another aspect in OSPF is the timers. We know that we use periodic timers to establish adjacencies and to maintain adjacencies. So we have a hello and dead timer for for establishing the adjacency and then for maintaining that adjacency. Uh, the default is 10 second hellos uh, for point to point links and broadcast networks. And then for every other type of network, non broadcast, uh, point to multi point, etc., it's going to be 30 seconds. All right. And then by default, we do a four times uh, dead timer interval based on the hello, time, hello timer. It doesn't have to be four times. You can individually configure the timers if you want. But by default, it's four times. Um, these timers absolutely have to match in order for us to form an adjacency. So uh, it's a little bit of a domino effect, right? If I, especially if I'm dealing with special types of networks, if for some reason one side is set to point to point, the other side is set to non-broadcast, the timers are not going to match. Uh, and I can either change the network type or I can go in and, and manually configure the timers so that they match. Timers are not negotiated though, all right? Definitely not negotiated. And I think you guys understand essentially what, what the impact of changing the timers would be, right? Obviously a longer timer period is gonna reduce the amount of overhead that we have on our links because we're generating less traffic, but it's also gonna increase the, the, uh, uh, the time it takes to identify whether or not a router is, is available or is connected. Show IP OSPF interface. We can see the timers are listed here under the interface. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, this says timer intervals configured, but, and that is for uh, Ethernet 1.1, but if I do a show run interface Ethernet 1.1, you can see that it's actually not technically configured. So configured doesn't mean what you manually configured, it just means whatever whatever exists on the interface, okay? So the hello dead timer, um, those have to match. Uh, and you can negotiate them. You make the timer shorter, it's gonna generate more traffic, but it'll also speed up the identification of a failed neighbor and potentially also speed up the, 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 the building a neighbor relationship, all right? Um, so what uh, we're gonna do now is go into router one and we're going to go into our serial interface, interface serial 2.0. And we're just going to change the timer. IP, OSPF, hello interval. And we're going to make that, uh, I guess, eight seconds. That's what they did in the book. IP, OSPF, uh, dead interval. Uh, and we'll make that 30, whatever. Uh, but so clearly in this case, our... our uh, our neighbor relationship hasn't gone down yet because it was already negotiated, but eventually it will expire and we'll lose that uh, neighbor relationship with whoever is connected to that interface. Let me make sure that I did the right one. Yep, I did the right one. Show IP OSPF interface serial 2.0. Uh, yep, hello, and uh, the dead is 30. There we go timer finally expired. And of course I deleted it because I hit exit. So right here we can see the timer expired. 
Uh, and I can do a debug uh, to actually see uh, that information. I could also do a neighbor detail uh, if I want to see the details of a particular neighbor. Let me see if I can show you what the debug looks like real quick, because that's not in the book. Let's do a debug IP OSPF. OSPF, and you can see there are a lot of different debugs that we can run, uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and do uh, my adjacency um, debug. Debug IP OSPF adjacency. There we go. And what I should see, uh, let me do a hello one also, because that one's going to show me my hello packets. What I should see is that there is a, a mismatch parameter error. And sure enough, that's what we see, right? Received a hello from 2.2.2.2, mismatch hello parameters. Uh, and let me do an undebug all. And scroll up, and I'll show you what we're seeing here. Uh, Received, dead timer received is 40. What I have configured is 30. Actually, R and C don't stand for receipt, received and configured, but that's what I always call them because that's what they actually represent. So I received a dead timer of 40, but I have a, a dead timer configured of 30. I received a hello of 10, but I have a dead timer, I mean a hello timer configured of eight. So you can even identify where that mismatch is and, and, and what's happening with that specific mismatch. All right. Another uh, helpful debug in this particular case. So we're going to wrap up this uh, chapter by just talking about uh, what are some of the limitations with forming adjacencies over different types of links. These are all of the uh, uh, slides that we already went through. There's the changing the timers, and then uh, and then they what they did is they ended up changing the timer on the other side as well to make the match. Clearly, that's going to mean that we're going to go ahead and synchronize again, and we're going to become neighbors again. So we don't have to necessarily do that. Uh, and then we can see that we've become neighbors. The neighbor's been up for 14, 14 minutes, 57 seconds, etc. OK? So let's talk a little bit about, uh, it, you know, kind of wrap up this lesson, big, long lesson. A lot of the OSPF lessons are pretty long, about what do we do on these different types of links, OK? Point to point. Uh, can be simulated with frame relay, but it, it is also a, a specific type of network, like an HDLC link or a PPP link. Those are actual physical point-to-point -point circuits. We do not require a DRBDR election. Now we know why, right? Because there's only two routers on the link. There's no way to reduce the number of adjacencies, so automatically the priority is going to be set to zero on a point-to-point -point circuit and we're going to send and receive our multicast packets using 224.0.0.5 because that's the all OSPF routers multicast group. All right. Uh, if it's a MPLS VPN, it's pretty much going to operate the same way. I mean, they're talking about essentially running on the PE to CE link OSPF. Typically, this is going to be a, an Ethernet connection, but it doesn't have to be. Remember, MPLS is not a physical layer standard. Um, so that link between the PE router and the CE router could be point to point. It could be broadcast. It could be non-broadcast multi-access because we can run uh, MPLS over frame relay. We can run MPLS over Metro Ethernet. So really, it just depends on what that local PE to CE connection is will de determine the behavior of OSPF on that particular connection. So the bottom line in this particular case is that there really is no effect of OSPF, um, uh, of MPLS VPN on OSPF. It's just that last link, the PE to CE link, that we have to be concerned with. All right. Now, we do know that a Layer 3 MPLS VPN does participate in routing. So it looks like a corporate WAN. It looks like a, a backbone network. It's running IP routing software. It's participating in the routing through the use of VRFs, virtual route forwarding instances, and so on. Uh, the only difference between the PE to CE design is that you have to agree with your provider as to what protocol you're going to run. If I am going to choose OSPF as my PE to CE protocol, we have to agree on authentication. We have to agree on area. Uh, we have to agree on, you know, hello timers, dead timers, anything that's going to be required for the routers to be able to form an adjacency, we're going to have to agree on. Now, if I'm running MPLS over a layer two MPLS backbone, there's two choices there, right? We can either do VPLS or we can do VPWS. Uh, 
But in either case, from the router's perspective, it simply looks like an Ethernet connection. All right. Uh, the only exception is we're not going to do things like spanning tree. But, but from a routing perspective, it just looks like an Ethernet connection. So it's a, either a sub interface on the router with dot one Q encapsulation, or it's a just a standard IP interface on a physical interface on the router. Uh, and we're just simply running EOMPLS, which is everything over MPLS. Uh, and, and the router's just, it's a broadcast domain, is essentially what it becomes, right? Just becomes a broadcast domain. One of the other things that we talked about in this uh, process is the different states, right? The down state, the init state, the two-way X start exchange and loading and full. Uh, so let's start by kind of breaking down each of these individual states. Uh, and uh, they, they go through this in the book, but I'm just going to describe them based on, uh, you know, kind of an easy way to understand. Obviously, down is pretty simple. Uh, I have OSPF configured. I have OSPF running, but I haven't identified any OSPF traffic or any OSPF neighbors. The init state means that I got a hello packet, but I haven't determined whether or not I can form a neighbor adjacency with that router. All right. Uh, there's there, actually there's twofold here. One of the components of an EIGRP hello packet. In fact, let me pull that up real quick. Mm -hmm. Not EIGRP. Why did I say EIGRP? OSPF hello packet format. Let's just do a Wireshark. Uh, one of the components of a hello packet is a neighbor list. And let's see if I can find one that actually has it. Uh, this is a hello packet, but I don't see the neighbor list. It's probably cut off. It's, it, would, it would be in these options here. Let me see if uh, I can find one here. If not, I'll just describe it. Now, eh, let me just describe it. Uh, no, I think I want to show you because uh, I think it's uh, important. Um, hmm. Be nice if I could just capture one, but my Wireshark integration into into um, GNS3 is not working presently. Uh, let's see. That's OSPF. This is a link state update. Link state update. Uh, I think I'm just going to have to. All right, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to. I don't get to see it here, but this is a good image of a of a, a hello packet. So, just like we had with EIGRP, we had a packet header, and then we had the payload information. So, what you're seeing here in the OSPF header, all the way down to authentication data, that is the actual OSPF packet header. So we see a version, OSPF v2 for IPv4. We see the, the code. This is a hello packet, which is an opcode of one. This is the packet link. This is the source OSPF router, which is the router ID. This is the area that I'm receiving the hello packet in. This is the checksum. And this is whether or not we're running authentication. And then attached to that is the actual hello packet. Subnet mask, hello interval, options. Uh, we don't need to talk about that. but uh, priority one, dead interval, DR, BDR, but something else that's to be included in here. Maybe this is just a, a capture uh, as part of the initial hello that goes out. But one of the things that's included in a hello packet is a neighbor list. Uh, basically, what I tell the other routers is who are my neighbors. Now, my, the other router I'm talking to doesn't really care who my neighbors are, but in order for me to transmit uh, to transit from the init state to the two-way state, I want to see my router ID in your neighbor list because that means that you recognize that I exist and you've identified me as a neighbor. So when both routers see each other in their neighbor list within the hello packet, that's when they go into the two-way state. They've identified each other as neighbors.
We're not exchanging anything at this point. We just simply identified each other as neighbors. Then we move into the extart state, unless we're both DR others, we stay in the two-way state. Uh, basically in the extart state, we're just trying to negotiate uh, which router has the latest information, which router is gonna become the master for the exchange of information, which router is gonna become the slave. Do not confuse this with DR, BDR, because that's not what we're talking about in this particular case. We're not talking about a DR, BDR election um, we're, we're talking about kind of identifying who's going to be the primary router responsible for exchanging information, right? Uh, also, we're identifying the ISN, the initial sequence number, and some other things as well. All right, sequence numbers allow us to identify how recent information is. And in the next few lessons, we'll get into a discussion about sequencing and, and the link state database and so on. So uh, once I get from the XStart state, then I go into the exchange state, all right? Both the XStart state and the exchange state use these, uh, one of the five packet types called a DBD. It's a database descriptor packet. So let's say, for example, I wanted to exchange routes. I wanted to become a neighbor with a router, and I'm now in the process of going through the convergence process, right? Um, rather than send my entire routing database, to the neighbor, and rather than my neighbor sending its entire routing database to me, I send a summary of my database, uh, and my neighbor sends a summary of its database to me. Uh, the analogy that I often use in class is, hey, I, I collect baseball cards. I have over 100,000 baseball cards. I don't actually do that because I don't really enjoy that sport that much, but I collect baseball cards. I have over 100,000 baseball cards, and I want to do an exchange with you. Uh, but I'm not going to give you the details of every single card and all the player stats and everything else on the card. Because you don't need to know all that to be able to identify what you have and what you don't have. I might just say, oh, it's a Topps card from 1985 and it's a, it's a, a rookie card for Bo Jackson or whatever. I don't know, whatever. Um, but I'm not giving you all the details of that particular player. So essentially, you give me a summary of your database. I give you a summary of my database. That is the exchange piece, all right? And uh, it says the routers describe their entire link state database, but we're not sending the entire database. We're just sending a summary of the database. In the loading state, so now we've done that. Now we move into the loading state where I say, you know what? You have this card, this card, and this card. I want those cards. Give me all the information about those cards. All right, well, you have this route, this route, and this route. I don't have those routes. I want you to please give me all of that routing information. So I send you a link state request saying these are the routes that I don't have based on your summary, and then you send me a link state update or a link state advertisement. Uh, updates and advertisements, not quite the same thing, but basically the same thing. Uh, I send you a link state advertisement. Uh, updates include multiple advertisements, by the way. I send you a link state update and basically just giving you all the information. So it's actually in the loading state is where we're actually either replacing information that's out of date. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not the latest information based on the sequencing or information that I simply don't have, right? Uh, and that's, that's the goal in this particular case, is to synchronize our databases. Once that exchange takes place, now we're fully adjacent and we have common databases. We both have essentially the same database in this particular case, all right? We didn't see this with EIGRP, right? In EIGRP, it was basically, you're a neighbor or you're not a neighbor. And that's, I mean, that's literally it. You're either a neighbor or you're not a neighbor. Uh, and then based on that neighbor relationship, you exchange routes or you don't exchange routes. So in summary, uh, with regard to network types at least, we can see the six different network types here, point to point, broadcast, non-broadcast, point to multipoint, point to multipoint, non-broadcast, and loopback. It's possible that you guys will be tested on this concept. Uh, certainly you already understand the impact that can occur if there is a mismatch between network types and so on. But two things you need to know about this table. 
is a DR BDR election going to take place? Because you need to make sure that you control how that takes place. And is automatic neighbor discovery possible? Here's the easiest way to remember it. If any of the network types include the word non-broadcast, then you're not going to be able to automatically discover neighbors. Otherwise, you can. So only two of these modes, we cannot do automatic neighbor discovery. Because non-broadcast means no multicast. All right. Secondly, anything that's point to something, point to multipoint, point to point, point to multipoint, non-broadcast, there is no DRBDR election. Everything else, there is a DRBDR election. So we can see that here. Um, DRBDR for point to point, no. Point to multipoint, no. Point to multipoint, non-broadcast, no. Uh, obviously, loopback. I mean, that's kind of an exception to the rule because loopbacks, we don't have any neighbors. We don't have anything to to, to share with, but uh, uh, or anybody to share with. All right. So. Um, that being said, if you do get tested on this, just remember those two things. Non-broadcast, no automatic neighbor discovery, point to anything, no DR, BDR election. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So we only have a couple more slides here to talk about. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is passive interface. Uh, it works exactly the same way it does in RIP. It works exactly the same way it does in, in EIGRP. Uh, you make an interface pass if it suppresses the protocol from running on that particular interface. So you can make all the interfaces passive and then make some interfaces not passive or vice versa. I do recommend use, using this concept. And the reason why I recommend using this concept is because obviously uh, you don't want to send out hello packets and, and uh, EIGRP or OSPF packets on an interface if there's no router there to listen to that information. But we still need to include those interfaces in the process because it's part of, I mean, those networks have to be part of OSPF. All right. Wow, that was a long one. Only uh, two hours and 40 minutes on that particular lesson. So, but it's a lot of good information. Um, we're not even, we haven't even scratched the surface though. Uh, so we're certainly going to get into a lot more of this in the next few lessons. So that concludes lesson number one of OSPF. We're going to do the challenge lab now, um, challenge lab for OSPF. And then the next lesson is even more in depth because now we're going to talk about what are link state advertisements, what are the different LSA types, uh, how do routers exchange information, uh, and how do we analyze the database, right? We're kind of progressing through. This is how we build neighbor relationships. These are all the things that are required to establish adjacencies. So now we need to go into the next phase, which is how do I manage all of these, all of this other information? Okay, so we'll see you guys in the next lesson.